Well, Wednesday is the uh, anniversary, the 60th anniversary of the assassination of John Kennedy. And uh, I, I have a, a deadline on my next book, The Hidden History of the American Middle Class. I have to have it in by December, uh, or the first week of December. And so I am going to be taking two weeks, and uh, 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 Jefferson Smith is going to come in and fill in for me for the next two weeks. And I'm going to be finishing a book. <laughs> so, uh, therefore, uh, instead of doing this uh, next week on the anniversary on, uh, of the JFK assassination, I invited Lamar Waldron to join me today for this last hour. And uh, let's, uh, let's blow up some myths here. J Lamar is known as the ultimate JFK historian. It's what Variety magazine said. He's one of the best investigative journalists in the United States. Uh, he's been re researching the uh, Kennedy murder for over 35 years, 33 of those years, nearly full time. He, we worked together for years uh, on two books, uh, Legacy of Secrecy and and um, uh, and and the uh, oh and the and the, the hidden oh well and, and uh, Legacy of Secrecy and Ultimate Sacrifice. Excuse me. And his book, his new book, is called The Hidden History of the JFK Assassination, and that's also the website, The Hidden History of the JFK Assassination dot com. So uh, Lamar and I are going to debunk some common myths. Lamar, are you with us? Uh, with you, Tom. Great to be with you again. Okay, great, thank you. So let's let's start at the beginning. Uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, I, I've heard so many people over the years say, "Oh, you know, Joe Kennedy was a crook. He was a mobster. He was he was a bootlegger." Um, uh, you know, even Gloria Swanson, who I knew quite well, we we used to have dinner together in New York in her apartment uh, all the time. She was on the board of uh, the Committee for Abused Kids we ran. And uh, she would tell me these horror stories about Joe Kennedy, although she never told me that he, she never said he was a bootlegger. What's the deal? Well, and, and, and she would have known because she was the mistress or a mistress of Joe Kennedy during Prohibition. Yeah, when she told she me was, that story. <laughs> when she was America's most famous and wealthy movie star. Yep. I mean, she was huge. Most people today, just for your listeners uh, who might be fans of Turner Classic Movies or classic movies in general, she uh, she was the big star in uh, the faded movie star in Sunset Boulevard. Mm -hmm. Great performance. And so anyway, so yeah, so, uh, so, so here's the problem with Joe Kennedy was a bootlegger, because chances are, if you asked 30 people on the street, what do you know about Joe Kennedy, JFK's father? If they knew anything, they'd say, oh, he was a bootlegger. Well, it turns out that Joe Kennedy was not a bootlegger at all. And we, we can thank a, a book called Last Call, The Rise and Fall of Prohibition by Daniel Okrent, who did a deep dive, like we've done on the JFK assassination, into that. And here's what he found out. So the Kennedy family uh, Joe Kennedy's father, uh, and Joe Kennedy, before Prohibition, came in, they were in the liquor business, the wholesale liquor, liquor business, some retail, that that kind of thing. Prohibition comes in, of course, they, they make some money when they sell all their stock, because everybody was stocking up, all the country clubs in America were, were buying all they could. And so uh, uh, Prohibition came in, uh, Prohibition made the mafia a big national force because they were heavily, they were heavily into bootlegging. And so um, Joe Kennedy was never a bootlegger. What he did before Prohibition ended, and by the way, Joe Kennedy was one of the only super wealthy people in America, and Joe Kennedy was super wealthy. Uh, he made his money uh, not from bootlegging, which he didn't, never did, but from legal, li legal liquor and especially from uh, stock manipulation, when stock manipulation was legal in the run-up to what people now call the Great Depression, as I learned from you and have verified, people used to call it the Republican Depression. So he made all of his money then. He was the only rich person, a super rich person, really supporting Roosevelt. The others hated Roosevelt. Uh, mafia hated that Roosevelt was going to end prohibition because they loved the bootlegging. And so, uh, so long story short, uh, Roosevelt got elected. Uh, uh, Joe Kennedy was appointed by Roosevelt the first head of the Security and Exchange Commission. And I, I think you said Gloria Swanson had a great quote yeah, about she that. Yeah, told, she told me that Franklin Roosevelt had told her personally, uh, and, and he thought it was a joke. Apparently, he told it to a lot of people that uh, he made Joe Kennedy head of the SEC because, quote, it takes a crook to catch a crook. Exactly, exactly. So, she and, thought and that then, was then quite he became, funny because he had robbed Kennedy her, became, in her opinion. Uh, 
Well, and, and he did. He did. He took over her money. Uh, he had a movie studio. They did a movie that was so over the top, directed by another star of Sunset Boulevard, Eric von Stroheim. And and so yeah, yeah. She she came out very badly in all that. Yeah. Uh, but but the bottom line is, Joe Kennedy later on he was on like a presidential uh, advisory board for intelligence in the early fifties. He had to undergo a security clearance for that by J. Edgar Hoover of all people. He passed that with flying colors. Now, oddly enough, the rumor, as, as this author tediously uh, uh, researched and found out, only began in 1954, and it was like a blip on the radar. Uh, then in the 1960 election, the master of smear, Richard Nixon, was running against Joe Kennedy's son, uh, JFK, and that's when the rumor took off, uh. aided by the smear machines of of Nixon and the mainstream media. Right. And so, you know, that was one of the things to attack Kennedy for, in addition to attacking him for being uh, Catholic, which was a big thing then, too. So, so right. bottom line is, uh, Joe Kennedy was never a bootlegger. Were there people that claimed to have information that said he was? Sure, none of them as close to Joe Kennedy as Gloria Swanson was for several years. But, uh, but yeah, so people make these things. They aren't credible. There's no evidence to back them up. And, and Joe Kennedy, after Prohibition, he had bought up you know legal liquor licenses for, for big brands and stuff. And so he, he, he profited greatly after that. But he was never a bootlegger, which then kind of ties us into another big myth uh, in that 1960 election. Okay, and that, and that big myth was? Well, as, as you can read in, in recent accounts of a movie, a, a big movie going to be directed by Barry Levinson, going to star Al Pacino and a bunch of other big names, and, and all these people. I mean, Pacino's a great actor, Levinson's a great director, David Mamet collaborated on the screenplay. He's a, he's a, he's a great writer. But if, if, and I'm, I'm just going to read the actual quote from Deadline.com, and, and it's going to be a new movie about how a Chicago mobster, Sam Giancana, arranged the assassination of President John F. Kennedy as, and I'm quoting here, payback for trying to bring down organized crime after the mob helped put JFK in the White House. So that's half true. I mean, you know, the, 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 the mob, uh, Giancana was involved in this, and the mob did want to kill Kennedy, but it wasn't because he was one of them. Bingo. <laughs> exactly. In other words, you know, the mob did not help to put JFK in the White House, period. Right. You know, no, no, no. Joe no Kennedy didn't that. have mob what? connections. I, I'm sorry, what was that again? And Joe Kennedy wasn't a mobster because he wasn't a bootlegger. E exactly. Now, and, and, and here's, here's two very important things. So not only is that not true, that the mafia helped put JFK in the White House, it's exactly the opposite of the truth. Because, it, and people can, can, you can do your own research, you can read my books, you can go on YouTube, you can see the footage. JFK and his younger brother Bobby Kennedy became national figures by going after Sam Giancana and the mafia in the late 1950s. They went after Sam Giancana. Uh, they even got Carlos Marcello, uh, the godfather of, of Louisiana and, and much of Texas, to testify. They got Giancana to testify. They tried to get Santo Traficante, Marcello's big partner down in Florida, but he, he hit out in, in Cuba because he was the kind of guy that had, you know, casinos down there. And so, uh, and they went after the mafia's ally and banker, essentially, a guy by the name of Jimmy Hoffa. So you can actually see, you know, clips of, of say, Bobby Kennedy and Sam Giancana at these hearings. I think it's like 1957, 58. And, and, and of course, the mobsters are all taking the fifth, and, and Giancana kind of giggles at the question. He thinks it's all a lark. And, and Bobby Kennedy is like, I, I thought only little girls, uh, you know, giggled, Mr. Giancana. You know, why don't you answer the question? And so they clearly, and you can see it. They hated each other yeah. from the get-go. Yeah. JFK announced his run for president in the very hearing room where they had gone after Sam Giancana in the mafia, and JFK made a promise. He said, look, if you elect me president, I'm going to really go after the mafia, which was badly needed because Hoover – in the early 50s, it kind of denied the mafia even existed. The Eisenhower-Nixon administration, uh, Nixon being the vice president, pretty much the mafia had the run of America, a, 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 huge, a huge presence in many even middle-sized cities you've never heard of before. I mean, and, and the mafia certainly had the run of Cuba. And so 
Uh, Nixon Lamar. was the mafia's candidate, and they gave him a million dollars in 1960 and cut a deal where they were going to assassinate Fidel Castro right before the election just to help Nixon win the election. Yeah, Nixon was the guy who had been in with the mob all the way from his 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 uh, beginning in his career. Remind me of the numbers, and we're going to hit a break here. But um, uh, m my recollection is that prior to the Kennedy administration, there had never been even a hundred prosecutions of organized crime in any one given year by by the FBI, and that after in the first years of the Kennedy administration, there were literally hundreds of prosecutions of the mob. Oh, I, 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 I have charts in, in the hidden history of the JFK assassination, and you can see the number of indictments. I mean, it doesn't go up five times. It doesn't go up ten times. It goes up a hundred times. Wow. The mafia was under tremendous pressure from the day JFK came into office, and he appointed as his attorney general Robert Kennedy. And, and, and they were leaking stories to the big news magazines and newspapers, and they were just going after the mafia. Uh, and, Lamar, we were talking about the CIA mafia plots. This uh, Richard Nixon, back in 1959, was vice president of the United States, and Cuba fell to, uh, to Castro, which produced kind of a political earthquake that helped uh, get Jack Kennedy into the, into the White House. Tell us about that. Well, uh, so you're right. Uh, Nixon was uh, the mob connected since 1946 in his very first race in California. He got mafia support for that uh, from an L.A. mobster at that time, uh, one of the two heads of the L.A. mafia named Mickey Cohen. And Mickey Cohen, by the way, wrote about that in his autobiography. It's like no big secret. But in any event, so so Nixon, uh, you know, so so the U.S. had actually given Castro some help. Uh, you know, the CIA loves to play both sides, just like they did with Iran back in the mid '70s and the Shah and the Ayatollah. So, uh, you know, um, the, the 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 CIA had given Castro some help. So, you know, and and it wasn't just Castro at that time. Castro was one of a dozen revolutionary leaders. He was the one that was most publicity savvy. So he wanted to come to Washington and say, look, this this dictator. Who, who Nixon had loved, named Batista, had fled, you know, with most of the Cuban treasury, were broke. Uh, you know, Americans at that time, that was the place to go vacation, especially if you were wealthy, was down in Cuba. So so, Nick, so Castro was going to come to the U.S. to, to kind of beg uh, Nixon, uh, uh, you know, for, for some financial aid. Right. And so Eisenhower didn't want – he had to meet with Nixon because Eisenhower didn't want to have anything to do with Cuba – and so he delegated all of Cuba to basically Richard Nixon, because he knew Rick Nixon had been to Cuba and had known Batista. And basically Castro came and basically begged for aid, and Nixon not only turned him down and said, you know, we're not going to give you a dime, you know, to make up for the money my old buddy stole from you, uh, but he started working with the CIA to kill Fidel Castro so he could put another right-wing dictator in. And so first went through Jimmy Hoffa to some of Hoffa's mob friends. That didn't work. So summer, uh, three months before the 60 election, Nixon orders the CIA and E. Howard Hunt. Uh, Nixon had been going for meetings at the CIA headquarters about this, which, by the way, we should have those files, but they've never been released, and says, look, you guys amp this up. I've got to have Castro dead before the election because Nixon, I mean, you know, Nixon was the elder statesman. JFK was the kind of young, fresh face. But, you know, if, if American troops were fighting in Cuba, Nixon was confident, and he was probably right, that the voting public would go with the experienced, you know, eight-year vice president over this relatively young senator. So, so the CIA reached out to a guy by the name of Johnny Roselli, who was uh, the Chicago Mafia's man in Hollywood and Las Vegas. Uh, because they knew that he could get them to the guy they really wanted to get to named Santo Traficante, who had casinos in Florida. Uh, he was the godfather of Tampa, kind of first among equals in Miami. And so Traficante was, was who they wanted to talk to. They had to, one of the CIA guys actually knew Johnny Roselli, so they went using an intermediary that worked for the CIA and Howard Hughes to get to Roselli. But then Roselli said, well, look, I'm, I'm the Chicago Mafia's man in Las Vegas and Hollywood, I got to bring my boss into it, Sam Giancana. Now, Sam Giancana was not a godfather like Marcello and Traficanti. He was a mob boss. Sure. But by the way, just so your listeners 
aren't worried. Uh, I'm on a landline phone. I think they can actually see me now because that actually gives the clearest voice connection of, you know, wireless phone, uh, cordless phone, all that stuff. So anyway, so so basically we are at the CIA mafia plots that were supposed that Nixon plots with the CIA. It was part of the same deal with the million dollar bribe the um, mafia gave to Nixon so that he wouldn't prosecute Hoffa because after the Kennedys has exposed Hoffa's wrongdoing, there was a lot of pressure for that, even though the Eisenhower administration didn't like to prosecute mafia uh, associates. So so basically, uh, uh, we now have in these plots Johnny Roselli, the Chicago mafia's man in Hollywood and Las Vegas. The CIA used him to get to Santo Traficante, the godfather of much of Florida and uh, who owned casinos. In Cuba, so that was the important part. But then Roselli insisted on bringing in his uh, boss, Sam Giancana, who was not a godfather like Traficanti, uh, but was a mob boss in Chicago because the godfather up there was semi retired. And so basically, that was all supposed to go down. The mafia was not stupid. Uh, the CIA wanted, and they actually said, look, we want you to kill Castro gangland style, you know, in an open vehicle, maybe something like that. So everybody knows he's dead. His brother, Raul, can't hide the fact that he's dead, you know. But but the mafia knew if if Castro were killed gangland style, the people in Cuba would blame the mafia and they would not let them reassume control of their casinos, which, by the way, were all still open. It's true Castro closed the casinos after he and his dozen associates uh, uh, took over Cuba, but he immediately reopened them and put a mafia associate by the name of Frank Fiorini, who later used the name Frank Sturgis, in charge of of you know handling the payoffs with the mafia. So the so the casinos were open. So that's why the mafia didn't want to you know kill Fidel Gangland style. They were going to try to poison him. A, a Chicago. A uh, made member of the Chicago Mafia, who also worked for the uh, Cook County Chicago Sheriff's Department, actually got as far as getting in to uh, Fidel Castro's office with some CA poison. That didn't work out. CA also tried uh, one of Castro's mistresses. That did not work out. So bottom line is uh, Kennedy won the election. You know, it was close, but not all that close, and, and became president. But now here's the important part. The CIA, you know, Eisenhower wanted to keep arms linked and just leave all that CIA mafia stuff to Nixon. And when Kennedy became president, you would think the CIA director, Alan Dulles, would have said, by the way, we've been working (laughs) with the mafia on the orders of the former vice president, and do you want us to keep doing that or not? That did not happen. Uh, Nixon had a lot of challenges. You know, rumor is he was a good sport, yeah, in public, but in private, they were pushing stuff even even right up till JFK was was inaugurated to try to reverse the election. Of course, it didn't work. And so, the CIA went to Nixon and uh, went to new President Kennedy and said, "Oh, by the way, uh, we've been trying to get rid of." Um, uh, Fidel, we're going to have this invasion where we're going to train a couple thousand Cuban exiles and send them in, and they're going to somehow defeat Castro's uh, 100,000-man army and militia. And and we want you to sign on to that. And JFK was real dubious about that, but he was like, okay, you know, you guys are the intelligence guys. And and so, the of course, that was never going to work, but what Alan Dulles and the CIA heads did was they continued the CIA mafia plots all the way through. And what so what became the Bay of Pigs invasion and a huge disaster early in JFK's presidency was just a cover for continuing the CIA mafia plots. In fact, the, the CIA was so confident that when they got word that the head of the Cuban army, the number three man in Cuba after Fidel and Rule, was uh, disgruntled and wanting to defect and might be willing to help the CIA, the CIA was like, no, we don't need the, we don't need the head of the, the Cuban military. We, we got the mafia. Well, it didn't work out. And so the Bay of Pigs disaster, does the CIA go to JFK and say, hey, we kind of fooled you on this. The invasion wasn't really going to work, that tiny invasion against all those. But we were – no. The CIA continues the plots without telling JFK and Bobby. Uh, they, the, the Kennedys don't find out until May of 1962, and then they're told they had stopped. But they continued. Right. At the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis, when we all thought we were going to get blown up, 
the CIA, with no authorization from the Kennedys, sends a hit team into Cuba that does succeed in killing someone that looked like Fidel, but it was a double, not the mm. real Fidel. Wow. And this so, was all, by the way, this was all part of Richard Nixon's campaign to get himself elected in 1960. I mean, let's not forget. Right. This was, right, you know, right. you know, and even when he lost that, even mob. when he lost the 1962 uh, governor's race in California, he was still thinking, well, when 64 comes around, I'm, I'm going to run again. And so that's why, you know, so the, I, I'm sure the CIA was thinking, yeah, yeah, well, yeah Nixon will be back soon enough. So now I, I do want to point out two important things, because I've, I've pointed out, you know, Sam Giancana and the Chicago Mafia had nothing to do with JFK winning in 1960. By the way, Part of that story is usually that uh, that uh, that America's one of America's richest men, Joseph Kennedy, needed forty thousand dollars from the mafia to help win the West Virginia primary back in '60. You know, but that's just ludicrous on its face, right? Because uh, you know, Joe Kennedy had more money than than almost anybody. So, uh, two thing two things are important. Now, Sam Giancana and Johnny Roselli both shared two girlfriends with JFK at different times, a woman by the name of Judith Campbell Exner and Marilyn Monroe. And in, in the telling and, and when she got money for it, Judith Campbell Exner would embellish the story and say, oh, I was taking money between Sam Giancana and JFK and carrying orders. But all that was totally debunked. And even people that had written about that, like Liz Smith, the, the columnist and reporter, you know, later admitted, yeah, yeah they were suckered about that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, also I just want to point out the Kennedys had nothing to do with killing Marilyn Monroe. I mean, she very likely committed suicide. Maybe she was under a lot of pressure. If she was murdered, it was the Chicago Mafia that did it because the weekend before she died, Marilyn Monroe spent that weekend with Sam Giancana and Frank Sinatra at the Calneva Lodge in Reno, Nevada. Uh, compromising photos and videos were taken. So she was under a lot of pressure. And sure, I, I think they tried to blackmail Marilyn into getting Bobby Kennedy uh, to her place in Los Angeles, and then they would get some photos of that, and then they could get the Kennedys to end this massive war against organized crime. But her death ended that. So the, the CIA mafia plots they continued into 1963, even when the CIA knew the Kennedys had their own plan to get rid of Fidel Castro uh, before the 1964 election season kicked off. And that was using the commander of the Cuban army, uh, Commander Juan Almeida, who had approached a Kennedy associate in May of 1963 and said, look, I'll stage a coup against Castro, because he's, he's killing off all the dozen people that helped him take power. And, you know, my, my time is probably limited. And so if, if, if you, the Kennedys, will back me, I will, I will stage a coup. And we've actually got the phone records where the man that Commander Almeida was talking to, someone you and I knew well, yep. Harry Williams. Yep. You know, Harry calls Bobby Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy calls JFK, you know, and, and then Bobby calls Harry Williams back and says, it's a go. Yeah. So Harry told us that December, story. On December 1st, 1963, uh, the Kennedys were going to have Commander Almeida stage a coup. Almeida would not take credit for the coup. He would blame it on a Russian or a Russian sympathizer because there were still 11,000 Russians still in Cuba. And the person in charge of uh, keeping track and, and housing all those people was Commander Almeida. So it would be very easy for him to blame uh, you know, the death of Fidel and probably rule as well on, uh, on a Russian or a Russian sympathizer. And then he would invite in uh, some uh, American help to keep the Russians from taking over. And, and you also talked to one of those people, the head of the Cuban-American military brigade at what was Fort Benning, Georgia, uh, General Anadio Oliva, and uh, who, who confirmed Commander Almeida's identity, the whole plan. And, and, and yeah. Oliva later became a general. So, I mean, he was, he was in charge of uh, civil defense for Washington, D.C., Big, a big, you Which know, is when position. I met yeah, exactly. When he, I think, semi-threatened you if you ever revealed it. Yeah, he was not at all happy that I knew uh, Almeida's name.
Right, right, right. So, 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 so that was what's supposed to happen. Now, and get this, this is the other part. So the Kennedys were waging a huge war against the mafia. Uh, they've got Marcello on trial in New Orleans. They're going after friends and associates and family members of Santo Traficante. As far as Sam Giancana goes, starting in the summer of 1963, under pressure from Robert Kennedy, the FBI starts following Giancana everywhere he goes, everywhere he goes, sometimes as close as 15 feet on the golf course, in restaurants, in nightclubs. And so uh, Giancana, this mob boss, is effectively kind of neutered, you know. And there's, it's not, he can't really have an active day-to-day role in killing JFK. He delegates that to Johnny Roselli, who works closely with Carlos Marcello and Santi Traficanti, to kill JFK. Uh, but use the secrecy surrounding this coup plan that you and I were the first people to uncover out of the government and then reveal, you know, but that wasn't until 2005. Mm-hmm. You know, that's how secret, because uh, Commander Almeida didn't die until 2009. And, and that's responsible for so much of the secrecy. But the Kennedys were not going to let the mafia be part of the coup plan. The Kennedys were not going to let the mafia reopen their casinos after the coup was successful. So the mafia had nothing to gain by waiting till after the coup. They weren't getting their casinos back and everything to gain by using the secrecy surrounding the coup plan to kill JFK in a way that would force the government, including Robert Kennedy, to withhold so much information. To essentially cover it up. So basically, this this program that was so incredibly top secret, the JFK Almeida coup plan, because remember, this is just a year after the tense nuclear standoff of the Cuban Missile Crisis. So we're talking, you know, November 1963 here. And and so, uh, you know, that's like the most secret thing in the world. I mean, uh, JFK Secretary of State, Dean Russ, personally told me when I interviewed him uh, back when we were working together. I went to Athens, Georgia, University of Georgia. He was like a professor emeritus sitting in his office. And he said, yeah, oh, the Kennedys didn't tell me about the coup plan that it was a real thing before JFK died. They said, well, you know, we're working on this. There's a possibility. And in fact, there are hundreds of pages of files that I helped to get released talking about the coup plan and how the, the um, you know, U.S. military is and, and say they're hoping to find someone high in the, in the uh, Cuban government that will help them. And they found a few lower level people. But, but basically, that was just all a cover. You know, because since May of 63, the Kennedys had found the guy. You couldn't get any higher. You know, the number three man in Cuba, uh, way more powerful than Che Guevara, and, um, you know, the head of the Cuban military. And so so even, you know, the Secretary of State and, and the Secretary of State, they weren't read in to this at all. Uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs knew. Several high CIA officials knew. Bobby Kennedy knew. Bobby Kennedy's number one aide, John Nolan, saw all this paperwork. Uh, and, 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 and as Nolan told me, and, and you found the first uh, declassified file, and then uh, a great uh, JFK researcher named John Nolan gave me others, uh, because the Kennedys knew they were getting ready to kill Fidel, basically, on, on December 1st, 1963. What if Fidel found out? What if he retaliated by trying to assassinate, say, the American ambassador to Panama? How would the U.S. react? And so there were a dozen meetings generating thousands of pages of memos, of which we have a couple dozen, uh, about what to do if that happened, what to do if Castro assassinated an American official. And as, as John Dolan told me, you know, you, you wouldn't want local officials to do the autopsy. You'd want the autopsy to be done at a U.S. military facility, et cetera, et cetera, because you wouldn't want to be rushed into, you know, nuclear war, World War Three, if it turned out Again, the example Nolan gave me, the ambassador to Panama was killed in a, you know, random street robbery. You know, so so they were making all these plans for what to do if an American official was assassinated. But but through several people, including Bernard Barker, one of the Watergate burglars, who in 1963 was E. Howard Hunt's assistant. And Hunt was one of two CIA agents assigned to work with Harry Williams. Harry didn't work for them. They worked for Harry Williams because they were doing things like, you know, helping uh, Almeida's wife and and a couple of his kids get out of Cuba, uh, giving them money in case, you know, Almeida was killed in the coup. And and Bernard Barker, Hunt's assistant, uh, was a long time. We know this from the FBI file. Since 1949, he'd been working for organized crime, specifically in 1963, 
from 1960 for Santo Traficante. Right. And so I've actually, I'm now up to eight different mafia people that knew about this top secret plan that even the Secretary of State didn't know about. And they were able to infiltrate that and turn parts of it to use to kill JFK in a way that would force that huge cover up. We're talking with Lamar Waldron, the author of The Hidden History of the JFK Assassination. Okay, Lamar, we've got about five minutes here. Let's, uh, let's land this plane. So long story short, uh, the godfathers of Louisiana and Texas, and much of Santo Traficante and Carlos Marcello, they had been planning for more than a year to kill JFK. We actually, again, have files about that. They'd been planning since the fall of 62 to kill JFK. Hoff had wanted to kill Bobby Kennedy because he was leading the charge against organized crime. But, but as, as Marcello told an FBI informant, who luckily told the FBI, you know, if you kill uh, if you cut off the tail of the dog, meaning Bobby Kennedy, the head will turn around and bite you. But if you cut off the head, the tail will quit wagging. So you should go after. So they'd had a year to plan it. There was an attempt to kill JFK in Chicago, you know, the home territory of Johnny Roselli and Sam Giancana. Uh, that uh, they, the Secret Service found out they called off not just the motorcade, but the entire trip to Chicago really angered Mayor Daley a lot. So the Secret Service knew all about that, and that there were some people at large that were not captured. But the mafia doesn't just have one backup plan. They, even their backup plan has a backup. So the backup for Chicago was Tampa. So JFK's longest motorcade of his presidency, the Florida Hotel, was huge. Imagine the Texas School Books Depository, only almost twice as tall. Every window opened in those days. Tampa chief of police, the first person who he said, I was the first person to ever call him about this, he, he said, yeah, they were worried. He advised JFK not to, to make that motorcade. We're at two uh, minutes, but, Lamar, just FYI. But um, uh, JFK went ahead with it because he had to give some remarks in Florida, that, in a speech that would be reported to Almeida, basically giving him the go-ahead. And then so that got canceled. But then, as we know, in Dallas. That was Plan uh, C. Is that Plan C, but that actually worked. But I, I, I tell you this: so on on tying the attempt to uh, to to what was supposed to happen to Castro. Castro was supposed to be shot in an open jeep in Veradero Beach, so that everybody could see that he was dead. You know that was applied. Bobby Kennedy was worried somehow somebody had taken, you know, what he knew was supposed to happen to Fidel and used it on JFK. Even the bullets found in Oswald's rifle were linked to a Dallas gunsmith who was uh, caught again by by an informant talking about how somebody can make a lot of money on the stock market because the U.S. was going to invade Cuba in December. So there were just so many things. That's why so much was covered up. Other myths we need to bust. There wasn't one official government investigation into you know, the assassination, the Warren Commission. There were six, right. uh, including the House Select Committee that said that JFK was killed as, as a result of a conspiracy and uh, uh, Marcello and Traficanti had the motive, means, and opportunity to have done that. Uh, the last investigation in the 90s that I helped on a confidential basis, they actually turned up uh, a confession that Carlos Marcello made to Jack Van Lanningham in federal prison. Um, and so uh, they have hundreds of hours of tapes of Marcello talking about things like Jack Ruby and Lee Harvey Oswald and, and stuff and Hoffa's disappearance. Those tapes according to the law, the 1992 JFK Act, should be released. They are not. There's, there, there are a dozen categories of files that have never been released and should great, be. Great stuff. Lamar, the, Lamar Waldron, the author of The Hidden History of the JFK Assassination. Thank you, Lamar.